remember, and if you haven't been here with us, uh, to understand the Sermon on the Mount, the key is to realize not only that Jesus is teaching a specific agenda that he has, you know, from God, but also that he is refuting a prevailing religious perspective. And without uh, remembering that fact, you will miss the correct import of this entire sermon. He is arguing for something and he's arguing against something. And what he's arguing against is the hyper-legalistic, self-righteous mentality of uh, rabbinic uh, Judaism and specifically the Pharisees and um, scribes who he names in this sermon as the ones that we have to do better than them. Okay? So... Chapter 7 starts out, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Judge not lest you be judged, as the King James says, famous statement of Jesus. Well, uh, remember now when we started the image of the Pharisee and the tax collector, that story in Luke chapter 18, verse 9, do you remember how he introduced the story. It says he told this story to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Okay, so what what we have to see here is that this last part, viewing others with contempt, is part and parcel. These two go together. Trusting in yourself that you're righteous and viewing others with contempt... This has to do with what we could call the dynamics of self-righteous judgment. To persuade yourself that I'm a righteous person, to be, to be like that Pharisee who says, I thank you, God, that I am not like other men, a sinner like other men. It's not only that he's persuading himself that his external compliance with religious law is awesome in the eyes of God, but it's also that everyone else is a sinner not like me. And so we get this self-righteous, this very familiar self-righteous sense from people that are into religion. And this is, this is what Jesus came to refute, to reject that principle. As a religious self-righteous person, as a person who is trying to establish my worthwhileness, my identity based on that I'm such a good and holy person, such an awesome spiritual person. It becomes psychologically necessary for me to identify people who are not on the same level as me. Because by that comparison between me and them, that's where I get the lift and the sense that I'm way more righteous than these guys are. Of course, I don't want to compare myself to God like Jesus does and in, in throughout this whole sermon. He says that's the standard. The absolute perfection you are to be, therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. There's your, if you want to compare yourself to someone. But that's not the way religion works. In religion, it's all about me comparing myself to these sinful people out here in the culture. And so when you look at it that way, you realize, okay, at the time they had a pharisaical religion, which was very influential and dominant, very self-righteous, and yet nothing has really changed. We still have religion just like that today, including a lot of what goes under the name of Christianity. would have to be, uh, sadly, described the same way. Now, Jesus says, look, the way you judge others, that's the way you're going to be judged. There's a basic legal principle there. You know, God looks down... He says, uh, and here you are, you're holding somebody in contempt. You're, you're judging someone. That guy's guilty over there. And so God's going to be like, yeah, well, what about your sin? You're guilty too. And then he'll be like, oh, well, I want to be forgiven for that. Dude, sorry. You didn't forgive him? I don't see why I should forgive you. That's hypocritical. Why would you accept forgiveness and grace, but you wouldn't extend it to others? So, I mean, that's perfectly fair. It's just hard to argue against that principle. Fortunately, we're not held under this standard, which we should be. And we went over last week 
how uh, under grace um, we're given forgiveness carte blanche and unconditionally and then God calls on us to respond to that like in Ephesians 4.32 um, I'm not going to go back over it again if you want to know about that you'll have to get the tape from uh, or the mp3 from last week but so this is again how should the law of God read seems pretty fair to me you hold, look over here and hold one person in contempt because they're a wrongdoer, then God should hold you in contempt because you're a wrongdoer. And that seems pretty fair. Now, at the same time, oh, and, and by the way, um, the author of this book, Matthew, was a tax collector. And so he was one who was held in contempt. I mean, they, the re reaction of the, of the religious leadership was to never even speak to a tax collector, to never have any dealings with a tax collector. They were utterly ostracized. And so this must have been a pretty welcome saying of Jesus from Matthew, you know, because he had spent all these years being harshly judged. And um, in fact, the, the rabbis taught, we have this teaching preserved for us in the Mishnah, that a tax collector could not be saved. They were unredeemable. So if a tax collector realized, you know, I, this is wrong what I'm doing. I shouldn't be taking money from, from my Jewish brothers and giving them to our conquerors, the Romans. So I'm repenting and I'm going to become a good, faithful, you know, um, loyal Jew again. And comes to the synagogue, they'd be like, sorry, pal. You should have thought about that before you became a tax collector. There was nothing they could do to go to heaven, period. That's judgment. And that, that's the kind of judgment that Matthew had been under probably for years before Jesus came, looked him in the eye and said, follow me, as we'll see. Now, having said all of that, there are legitimate types of judgment. Jesus is not saying that there's no judgment that we can make. And in fact, the word judge and in Greek is krino, and a whole collection of words based on that root is similar to what we get in, in English, where you, know, you could say someone's got good judgment, or you could say that somebody's judgmental. Very different meanings there, right? One's positive, he's got good judgment, means that he's discerning, he's, he's able to weigh things out well. Whereas somebody that's judgmental would be this type of thing, the self-righteous, condemning judgment in the condemning sense. And so it's similar, it's the same thing in Greek, where it can be used in different ways. For example, Jesus himself says in John 7, do not judge according to appearances, but judge with righteous judgment. Uh, so it's clear that he's not against all judgment. In this same chapter, later, he will argue, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but in, uh, inwardly are ravenous wolves. And he goes on to tell them, you'll know them by their fruits. And so he is calling on them to, you know, use their powers of observation to watch somebody's deeds, their actions, their fruits, and to make a judgment as to whether they're a false prophet or not. Because uh, you can't just tell they don't, a false prophet doesn't look like a false prophet, they look like a sheep. It's only on the inside that they're a wolf. So clearly, uh, the ability to discern between truth and falsehood, between good and evil, Apostle Paul teaches the same thing, 1 Corinthians the spiritual man discerns all things, yet he is discerned by no man. This word discern is diacrino, and putting the dia means to discern, to, to judge through. It's a deep, you know, kind of a strengthened form of the word, meaning, and it's well translated as discern, and judgment can mean that. Here's 512. What business is it of mine to judge those outside of the church? Are you not to judge those inside of the church? And this is in connection with this raw incident where this guy was actually sleeping with his mother, living with his mother in, in the sexual relationship. And Paul's just like, if you can't tell that that's wrong, it's like, you know, I don't even know what to say. It's, he's just flabbergasted in this whole chapter. I mean, it's like even the non-Christians know that's wrong. They would never tolerate something like that. And yet the Corinthian church, so uh, he's like, you know, make that judgment call. Make the call. Yes, we are to judge good from evil 
based on the word of God. It's not a judgment that we make on our, based on our own opinion. <clears throat> so Jesus is certainly not teaching relativism here. And I've heard the verse actually quoted that way. Judge not lest you be judged means, you know, you can never say that anybody's wrong about anything. Just, you know, everybody's right in their own little way. And that is very far from what Jesus is teaching here because this whole sermon is an argument, in fact, that he's up against a very false and wrongful form of teaching. What he's, what he's calling for is to replace this religious quest for importance and status with, with relationship and love. See, that's what the, the form of religion that we're looking at here is all about trying to uh, impress people. You know, we talked about how they would pray on the street corner. Oh, God, you know, bring in their big sack of money and sound the trumpets, you know, all these different ways of showing off their righteousness. And this, this part, the negative part, where that guy's a sinner, that's a sinner, that's a sinner, everybody's a sinner, is all part of the same thing where it's puffing myself up by pushing everyone else down. And that's what Jesus is against here. And he's saying that whole quest is wrong and instead we should learn to relate to people. So he gives us a couple of really profound principles in connection with relationship. This one. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye but you don't notice the log that's in your own? What a funny picture. You can tell he had a sense of humor. How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, and behold, here's a log, a beam in your eye, and you're like, let me see here. He says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly enough to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So we've got two propositions here. First taking the log out of my eye, and then I can see clearly to take the speck out of my brother's eye. He's not saying you can't take the speck out of your brother's eye or that you shouldn't take the speck out of your brother. Maybe your brother does need that speck pulled out of his eye, but you're in no position to do it when you've got a big beam sticking out of your eyeball. Now, how come it says that my, mine is a log and the other guy's is just a speck? That's, that's not how I view it. Maybe I'm in a conflicted situation where I'm, you know, kind of having a conflict with a roommate or something like that. And I'm like, you know, I would say, frankly, his part is a lot more serious than mine. You know, maybe I'm not perfect in this situation, but it's obvious who the main bad player here is. And I'd say it's, he's got this log, that's what I would say. And we all, that's usually, I mean, that's typically how we feel about it, right? It's like, I'm in the right here. The reason I believe Jesus says this is that anything is a log when it's in your eyeball. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you can just imagine taking a, 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 a chunk of sawdust and putting it inside of your eyelid. You know, it would drive you crazy. You know, you would be rubbing your eyes. You couldn't see straight. You'd be dripping tears. I mean, it, that would be awful. And, that's, and so this is the way we're to understand it. He's, it's not necessarily that your sin is so much worse than the other person's sin. It's that it's in your eyeball and that causes problems, namely that your own sin affects your view, your perspective. You can't see straight because you haven't dealt. You're working from a sinful base, okay? And that is bending your perception of things. And so... To be able to work with another person and, and even to help them with a problem they may have, it's essential that we get that out, that, that we deal with our own moral issue in this. <clears throat> and so that's why you have to pull your piece out first. See, the order is what's important here, not more than the size. It's the order. First comes my issue. Then we'll go to work on that person's issue. I think this is one of the real important passages in the New Testament. I think every this should be a memory verse for Christians. I should remember this because this will save you so much trouble in your life. 
you will have so much victory in your life if you learn to practice what Jesus is talking about here. This, this touches on many areas. For one thing, he's rolling out the concept of humility in conflict situations. You know, where here we both have a problem. I'm perceiving you've got a speck in your eye, and yet I've got a log in my eye. And so the pattern, the normal pattern of human conflict is, dude, you're in the wrong. And the other guy's like, no. No you're in the wrong. And the other one's like, actually, you are in the wrong. And the other one's like, no, you are the one in the wrong. And so on it goes. This can escalate. All of a sudden, somebody busts in and says, you know what? I'm in the wrong. Oh, oh, oh. That just totally disrupts that that whole rhythm of antagonism and now somebody has done the unthinkable and has gone before God and has discovered I'm actually I, I have moral wrongdoing uh, that I need to deal with here <clears throat> uh, I've been reading uh, Richard Lovelace's book uh, Dynamics of Spiritual Life. It's a very intriguing book. And one part of that, he's got a chapter in there on why spiritual uh, uh, awakenings go bad. He's a historian, a church historian. He's an expert on movements. and That's an interesting chapter, in fact. Uh, and one of the things he's studying is some of the thinking that was going on at the time of the so-called Great Awakening in New England when uh, hundreds of thousands of people had came to personal faith in Christ. But then there came, a lot of fanaticism came up along with it and a lot of people eventually lost their faith and it was, it was not as good as people had hoped. And so uh, writers at the time were going back and forth about, you know, how to interpret this. And this one guy named Chauncey thought the whole thing was just a big, uh, a major blot and a loser. And he was answered back by Jonathan Edwards, who wrote his famous book, Christian uh, uh, Religious Affections, and uh, another one, Reflections on the Awakening in New England. And one of the things that Edwards points out is that uh, something that brings down uh, real movements of God is spiritual pride. And I thought some of these comments were pretty interesting to think about, especially since we find ourselves in a position where uh, we have kind of an awakening happening here, I think right now on uh, LSU campus. And it would be a shame to see that turn bad. Anyway, think about some of the things that Edwards talks about and just in reflecting on the, the contrast between real humility and pride, in this case, spiritual pride. He says, spiritual pride is very apt to suspect others, whereas an humble thing is most jealous of himself. He's so suspicious of nothing in the world as he is of his own heart. Learn to question himself. The spiritually proud person is apt to find fault with other saints, that they are low in grace, and to be much in observing how cold and dead they are and being quick to discern and take notice of their deficiencies. Oh, I've been there. I know what he's talking about there. But the eminently humble Christian has so much to do at home that he's not apt to be very busy with other hearts. He is apt to esteem others as better than himself and is ready to hope that there is nobody but what has more love and thankfulness to God than he and cannot bear to think that others should not bring forth no more fruit for God's honor than he. Well, it's a little hard to follow that old language, but you know, I think he's making a real interesting point here. When we sit around and we got that critical heart all the time, it's not a good sign. It's not a good sign. And we should be, instead, if we want to get critical, we should, we should realize, I've got, I'm no, I should distrust myself more. That's, that's taking the log out of your own eye. Well, another area that this touches on. So I think uh, Jesus is teaching, if we come into a conflict situation and we introduce humility, we absolutely sever 
that negative rhythm of hostility of which humans are so notorious and we introduce something from outside of this world, something that comes directly from God himself who humbled himself in Christ to an amazing degree as we studied on the incarnation. And that's how you end enmity. That's how you reconcile. This also relates to then a, a, a related principle that we could call reciprocity. I, I didn't actually make this term up. This is a term that comes from um, a marital counseling. Reciprocity is the observation that people tend to reciprocate behavior of others in a relationship. That when two people are relating to each other, it could be people uh, like it could be some roommates at your house. It could be, uh, you know, your girlfriend or boyfriend, something, but whoever the relationship is with, people in your home church, that when one person acts uh, in a certain way, we can observe that there's a tendency, it's not absolute, but there's a tendency to reciprocate in a similar vein, backward. You'll see this if you just watch people interact. You see negative reciprocity. For instance, if one person is judging and coming down on the other, the next thing you know, we hear that person judging them back, right? I mean, it's pretty hard, frankly, when somebody is judging the hell out of you to uh, come back with all kinds of grace and love. And instead, you, you, you tend to feel like, you know, so who do, you, who do you think you are? You know, who are you to talk about this? And we come back and bring judgment against them. Uh, reciprocity. Hostility. When people are hostile to us, we tend to be hostile back. It's a defensive reaction. Sarcasm. You know, you know, yeah, yeah, you're messing around with the guys and people are being real sarcastic, you know, they're everything you try to say something and they're like, yeah, yeah right. You know, and and uh, just scoff at it. Everything's an object of scorn and sarcasm. Now it makes it pretty difficult in that situation to come out with something, you know, and say, guys, I got something really vulnerable I'd like to share with you right now. I got a problem I'd like you to pray for me on. In that setting, I'm sure. You know very well it's going to be scorned and sarcastically scoffed at, so you, you shut that part up, and instead you join in and throw out some good sarcasm of your, of your own. Reciprocation in uh, cynicism, you know, where... We just refuse to believe that good things can happen in people's lives. That, you know, everybody's in it for themselves. You know, we say, oh man, so and so did a beautiful thing the other day. Oh yeah. Probably, he's probably getting some kind of kickback on the side. I'm sure he's got an advantage, you know. That's what he says he did. He's probably faking it. And so everything is played off, everything is dissed. Uh, we don't believe that there's any really uh, true goodness. High expectations. Oh, 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 this is devastating. Like in a marriage uh, or with roommates. It's like, you know, I just feel that a relationship should live up to certain standards. And that's all there is to it. I mean, that's just, just basically obvious. Of course, it's not obvious to anyone else, just to you. <laughs> but these become the grist then for the resentments and... You know, this, is, this tears marriages apart. When marriages, when married people have these high expectations for each other, no one can ever meet each other's expectations. And the more that's expected from me, the more I come back with expect expectations back. And so we're in a downward spiral that is a tailspin into death at that point of that relationship. Disengagement. This is when people just start to finally, you know, back away from each other. We're just like, I've had it. And so, yeah, you're still in the same room, but you just don't talk to the person. You just don't engage with them. You're like, hey, yeah, hey. And just walk on by. Like, relationship is, is disintegrating. We don't want closeness. We're refusing it. And when somebody's treating you that way, then you're just like, fine, suit yourself. Idiot. I don't need to relate to you. And so disengagement brings disengagement. It's, uh, yes, we are, we are reacting off of each other. That is happening. Ignoring one another. 
We look over and think, I'll bet he's probably sad about that thing that happened. <laughs> Whatever. It's his problem. I'm busy. I'm not going to go over and, and get all tied up in his dysfunctionality right now. You know, I got my own problems. So we just ignore what we know there's a need that I could probably meet. And so that becomes an atmosphere. That becomes an ethos in a group where we all start to ignore each other. Uh, distance comes in. You know, pride, frankly, is one of the worst when it comes to negative reciprocity. The person who's trying to do one-upsmanship, who's trying to outdo everyone else and show how awesome they are, makes everyone feel like they have to do the same thing. I mean, it just feels pretty awkward when you got somebody showing off and flaunting their awesomeness to come in and say, yeah, well, I'm a complete failure. What about that? <laughs> it ain't easy. It's probably not going to happen. You'll probably just sit there thinking, mm, well, I did some good things too. And uh, so the, the BS piles up on top of each other, and it's devastating. This is, frankly, this is probably uh, a good way to understand a lot of dysfunctional social systems including family systems. Families are this way. Social groups are this way. Home churches are this way. Ministry houses are this way. And uh, to one extent or another. The, the good th thing is it works in the other direction as well. Positive reciprocity. Here is where Christian, under the influence of the Holy Spirit and empowered by Him, can realize... I'm going to be the first one to stick that foot out and take a step away from this negative pattern of relating. I'm going to take and positively and consistently invest even though I'm being ignored, even though I'm, I'm being disengaged from, uh, I'm being uh, put down and scoffed at, and the person's difficult and hard to relate to. I'm just going to keep boring in there and keep investing and keep loving and it works on people, you know? It's just like you, uh, I've heard so many people share their own testimony where I was such a mean, you know, uh, uh, just uh, some word usually follows at that point. And, you know, and yet they just kept loving me and I couldn't understand it. And, and, so, it's, and it, so it just breaks you down. You start to think, you know, what's wrong with me? And then there's a rest of reciprocation in the positive sense, where you start to think, maybe I should invest back. Forgiveness. When there's forgiveness coming from one person, then the other person is more willing to forgive at that point. One of the reasons that people have so much trouble forgiving one another is because of self-protection. You know, it's because if I forgive this, then the liability for that crime I have to absorb into myself. You know, that's why Jesus used forgiving the, uh, people their debts. And, you know, God, forgive me my debts as I forgive the, those who are debtors to me. One of the words for forgiveness means to write off a bad loan. Like you loan a person money and you just are like, look, you don't have to pay it. Who's gonna, who pays that money then? I do. I have to absorb that myself. And that's why people don't want to forgive. But it's funny that when you have a forgiver there... Who, who was obviously wrong, but he forgives and he's full of grace. It's that atmosphere of grace begins to spread in a, in a, within a social group. And people feel like, you know, maybe, maybe forgiveness is better than resentment and bitterness. Warm, enthusiastic affect, affect in the sense of feeling of, you know, you know certain people, you see them and they're just uh, like, dude, and they're just happy to see you. You know, you can tell they're, they're warm. A lot of these people are handsy or whatever they, uh, you know, they want to show you, they want to show warmth. They project warmth comes off of them. And so uh, when we get a few uh, choice givers of this sort in our group, it makes all of us feel more comfortable being a little more warm. You know, being warm and friendly doesn't seem dorky or weird anymore. Uh, it seems wholesome. It's good. And so we reciprocate back deeds of service. Instead of arguing about whose turn it is to do the dishes or clean the living room, we find out, uh, man, it was my turn and somebody already did it for me. What a different atmosphere. 
you know, and so this, again, um, individuals are able to take initiative in love giving here, and it has an effect on everyone around them. Affirmation and encouragement. Uh, I've been in groups where people just didn't, didn't do this, didn't practice, and it's dismal. And then, you've, then I've been in other groups where people just uh, were very conscious about, very intentional. They would write uh, during their times of prayer, write ideas for people they could encourage, ways they could encourage that would be effective. You get this going in a group, and, uh, and you can just feel the health of that group rising, the morale of the group rising. Yeah, being easy to please. This is the opposite of the high expectations. You know, the person who's a hardliner is holding everyone to this super high standard and is going to be raging in their face if they don't come through versus what Scripture teaches us about true biblical love, which includes the idea that I'm easy to please. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, Jesus, uh, 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 Paul taught that love keeps no record of a wrong suffering that it covers all things, it hopes all things. It's very positive in that regard, very easy to please. That's something you have to cultivate. And when people are, you know, think about it, in a relationship. What is it that you want in a relationship? For most of us, truthfully, nothing is as enjoyable as feeling like I'm approved of, like approval, you know, from the people I love. And nothing is as depressing and as burdensome and weighing down as this sense that I know that my friends that, that I care about are not happy with me right now. And that will weigh you down. Whether it's deserved or not, you know, we're, we may be being manipulated and yet it will still have the effect. But when we start to project this gracious, easy to please uh, outlook, then other people will become easier to please too and can turn the situation around. Showing appreciation for the relationship as opposed to just taking people for granted and, and secretly, inwardly thinking, you know, they should be doing better. He's an idiot. Makes me sick. So uh, we'll say these type of things inwardly and we've got all these negative thoughts. We never maybe sit down and really cultivate and before God just think about I really appreciate this relationship, you know, and uh, have God show us the good things about one another, the potentials that are there. So, and, and to uh, the lack of judgment and the willingness to admit fault, which is taking the log out of your own eye. This right here. This will be reciprocated. If I can show up and say... I was wrong about that when we were arguing the other day, and I've, I've, I see that. It's far more likely that my adversary will see that where he was wrong. Here's how you do it. First of all, get there first. Uh, that's what it says, right? First, see the word first? I need to get there, and I need to be the first one. Usually it's the most spiritual person is the first one that comes in and says... I'm in the wrong. We have to be willing to admit I was in the wrong, wrongful in a moral sense, not just like I made a mistake, but that I, maybe I made a mistake, but it was based on a, a, a morally wrong intent that I had, and that I need to be forgiven. And will you forgive me? And I like to, the phraseology I was taught on this, where you say, God has shown me that I was in the wrong the other day when I raised my voice during that talk we had. And you know, maybe the content of what I said, maybe that wasn't the wrong part, but maybe it was the way, the tone, the unloving tone that I took with you. And the fact that I indulged my uh, fleshly anger uh, in a way that was really unedifying. And so God has shown me that. The reason for saying that part is that we're saying, look, I'm not reacting to your anger or, or being manipulated by you here at all. This is something between me and God. 
Okay, this is something God has shown me that I was wrong about. And with regard to you, I'd like to ask you to forgive me for that. This really puts people on the spot. Boy, they didn't see this coming. They saw you walking up and they thought, oh, here it comes round four. Let's go. Bring it, baby. And all of a sudden you're saying, you know, God has shown me that I wronged you uh, when we were talking about this. And I want you to, I need your forgiveness. I just did this myself recently. I'd been out complaining. I was in the flesh. I was complaining about things. And in the course of it said several things that actually wounded, hurt the feelings of a couple of the people there. Now, later, uh, and so uh, an argument ensued and uh, later, as I was thinking and praying about that, it was like, like it says, God showed me. And so I got there first because we were, happened to be, uh, me and the brother happened to be having lunch together uh, a few days afterward. And the subject came up and uh, he said, now about that talk we had the other night there, and I said, I, just before we even start, I said, I, I just feel like, you know, I've seen this, the Lord has shown me this. I was out there, I was bitching, I was in the flesh, and uh, I said things, and I named a couple of things. I said, they're not even true. I know they were hurtful, and uh, I need to be forgiven. And I said, please, just forgive me. I was in the wrong. And you could, you know, try it sometime. You'll see the person just kind of reeling. They're just like, whoa, 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 now what do you do? And of course, you know, and he was sort of like, well, okay, I will forgive you. He said, and I still want to talk about it. And I was like, that's fine. Let's, yeah, definitely we'll talk about it. But the tone of that talk, of course, went completely different from that moment on. Totally different than it would have gone the other way. Learn the power that Jesus is teaching here of getting the log out of your own eye first. It's powerful for a relationship. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. Now, he also says in verse 6, Do not give that which is holy to the dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. That was one of my uh, favorite underground bands in the 60s was named Pearls Before Swine. Which is kind of a cool name for a band when you think about it. They obviously had a high view of themselves, but. I also like the King James version of this verse, which is, you know, throw not that which is holy to the swine, uh, lest they turn ye on and rend ye. <laughs> turn ye on and rend ye. Jesus knew that soon him and his followers, the people listening to him, were going to be under persecution, and he knew who was going to be leading the charge for persecution too, and it would be the religious. They, he knew that they were going to kill him, and they did, and that they were going to kill, imprison, and beat, and attack his followers, which also happened. And so that's kind of the context here, again, always remembering how he's basically warning people about the, the critical danger posed by this uh, hyper-religious milieu they're in. And, uh, and uh, frankly, nobody is more murderous than the religious man, when you think about it. More Christians have probably been slaughtered by far uh, by re other religious people than by secular people. Uh, secular people are murderous too, but... At least we can say in uh, Christian history, most Christians have been killed by so-called Christians. Not even other religions. It also introduces a related concept, uh, which we could call the idea of boundaries. I don't know if you've studied uh, the notion of having boundaries in your life. Uh, Henry Cloud, a number of authors have written extensively on this, and I think it's a good point, which is that, 
you know, I am just a human being here, and I am not God. I'm not the savior of the human race, all right? And other people, they're humans too, and so I have to accept my limitations, okay? All I can do is just speak as a fellow man. And other people are making their choices, and those choices are free. There's not necess- I have to, if they're refusing what I bring to them, what I offer, then I have, to, I have to have some respect for that and say and be willing at a certain point. Yeah, I can argue the point. I think we can argue points with people. But you just reach that point where you start to realize, I'm not making any headway here. And uh, the person's made their choice. And so I'm going to respect that. And that is one reason why it's so urgent that we find responsive people because they're out there. People wonder about this. Well, I can't believe Jesus is referring to people as, as pigs. And I don't think he is. I think he's talking about literal swine, real, real pigs. You go out to the, to the hog pen and you walk in there and you're like, piggy, 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 piggy. And you, th- you got some choice pearls, all right? Costly pearls. And you're like throwing the pearls out so that the pig can have them. A gift. The problem is, you know, uh, pigs have no use for pearls whatsoever. They don't understand the value there. They never wear pearls. They just have no use for them. (laughs) They're more likely to think that it's you're you're engaging in a hostile act. He probably thinks you're throwing things at him, and he will turn ye on and rend ye. You know, then again, you could take a pig, you could sit him at the dinner table and dress him up in clothing and put a, like a bow on him and things like people actually do that. And, you know, it's still, it's still a pig. That's all it is. So, in other words, what we're saying here is uh, what we're looking for when we try to share the uh, truth of God is we're looking for real, willing change of mind. And not that we're going to just, you know, keep twisting someone's arm, trying to get them to comply with what we want. Let go. Don't do that. And so uh, instead of trying to keep battering somebody down when they've said no, 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 it'd be better to find someone that is responsive. You know, there are people in the thousands, in the tens of thousands, probably right in our own city here, who would be astonished if they found out that they could have a personal relationship with God and that it would be free of charge. Uh, That have no idea that there's such a thing as the body of Christ where they could be accepted, loved, and built up. And if they knew about it, they would be all over it. They would be responsive to that. But nobody's found them yet. And sometimes you'll hear Christians and they're still banging away. I know someone that has been banging away at the same person for five or six years and is angry and inconsolable that even after all of this, they still haven't repented. Dude, find someone else. Okay, they don't want to change their mind. Get over it. People are free choosing beings. It's not up to us to beat people down. We make an offer, we explain God's offer, and uh, people need to make the choice. We can always check back later to see if they've changed their mind. There's nothing wrong with that. Also, prayer would still be effective. When you reach a point with somebody where it's a dead end, where they're not moving, where they're saying, "Uh, uh, look, just shut up and don't bother me with this anymore, you respect that and you back away, but you can continue to pray for the person. In fact, prayer is exactly what comes up next in this passage. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open." Well, of course, the original context of this is he's addressing this to people that are seeking God. So I don't think it applies to any and all asking that you do. We know that from the rest of the New Testament and Jesus' own teaching that it has to be uh, in accordance with God's will. He's talking about people that want to know God, that want to find God. 
seekers. And he says, if you're seeking, uh, then, then uh, you'll find. And, and of course, if you were a real seeker, then you would ask, wouldn't you? Anybody who really wants to know God, wouldn't they ask God to reveal himself? Wouldn't they have enough integrity to do that? What harm could it do? If he's not there, nothing's going to happen, right? And we really, uh, we, we are confronted today with the specter of the kind of professional seeker. You know, some people like the image of the seeker. It's like, I'm, I'm a seeker for truth, even though I know I'll never find it. And you're just like, how do you know that? You know, it's because you've made up your mind that you're not going to find it. You're not, not going to accept it no matter what. You just want to be a seeker, not a finder. That's pseudo-seeking. You're not really seeking at all unless you're actually trying to find. And if you're trying to find and you're a seeker, then you would ask. And Jesus says, when you do ask, guess what's going to happen? It's going to be answered and the door is going to open. God will come and, and uh, meet you. He'll show himself to you. That's why we don't want to ask. I've talked to seekers just even in, in recent history. You were like, so I was like, I'm like, so are you going to ask God to reveal himself to you? No. Oh, why? I don't know. I don't feel like it. I just wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. It says it all, doesn't it? You made up your mind. You don't want it. You know, you know why you're not asking. It's, be it's not because you're afraid that he won't answer. It's because you're afraid he will answer. Yeah, that's why. And that's why you're not comfortable with it. If he answered, then you'd have to do something about it. Well, <clears throat> this whole section gives us really a real insight into God, especially these last couple of comments where he says, what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, then he won't give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to good give good gift to your children, how much more? Will your Father who's in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Well, <clears throat> remember now, again, the Pharisaic tradition that he's addressing did not view God this way. They did not see God as being generous, eager to give, and, uh, and uh, loving like that. They saw him as quite stingy, in fact, uh, requiring very high standards of performance before he would grudgingly maybe have to give you something for that. But not the type of person who is eager to give, who can't wait for a chance to give out. And so Jesus is talking about something new here. And it's not just the Pharisaic tradition. It's the religious mentality doesn't view God as being generous and giving like this. But rather, he has to be placated, paid, through hard discipline, and then perhaps he will uh, give out something. Think about that. Is that the way God is? Or are we projecting our own fallen nature onto God? Are we really saying, if I was God, I'd be sure to get mine first, because that's probably the way we would be. That's the way we are. And what would it be like to be a being like God who needs nothing. He doesn't need anything from us. He's got all of his needs completely met in himself. And uh, what it means is that God's more interested in what he can give out than on what he can get from you. He doesn't want anything from you. He wants you to let him love you, to let him come into your life, to let him forgive your sin, to let him give you eternal life with him and Jesus is using this, this is one of these a fortiori arguments, um, if this, how much more that, to say, you know, a human father who would certainly love his own children, or at least we would, you know, should be that way, usually is, often is, how much more would a God who is not afflicted by sin in any way love the, the uh, people he's created? And so in verse 12, he wraps it up saying, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, 
For this is the law and the prophets. This is the famous golden rule. The King James is do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? People that have never read a word from the Bible a lot of times happen to know that verse. You say, well, what do you do about spiritual thing? I just do unto others, you know. <laughs> Some people have changed it into kind of a karmic law promise that if you do unto others, then they'll do unto you. And it just, there's nothing about that there. doesn't promise that at all. It's just uh, use the guide. What would be good? What would I want for me? What would be good? I would want what was good for me. And so uh, that's what I'm going to do for others, is what's good for them. And it's a basic, that's the basic uh, underlying principle of uh, self-giving love that animates and fills this whole uh, sermon of Jesus, practicing love with one another. And as he says, it's kind of, this is the law and the prophets. This is basically what God's always argued for. All throughout the Old Testament, you can put it all down, it all comes down to love. And uh, that's what it is. So, we'll draw the line there for night.